Over the past six decades, lasers and laser-based devices have become indispensable in many areas of society. With its long-range narrow beam that can be focused into a tiny spot, a laser provides high power over a small area. And this is, of course, useful for cutting, drilling, welding, but not only that, it's also useful for laser surgery and laser skin treatment. The laser is truly one of the many examples of how so-called blue sky discovery in fundamental science eventually may transform our daily lives. The Nobel Prize in Physics for 2018 has been awarded for groundbreaking inventions in the field of laser physics to Arthur Ashkin, Gerard Mourou, and Donna Strickland. And all of these three will be giving talks. Unfortunately, Dr. Ashkin will be giving a talk by proxy, but nevertheless sends a greeting. Arthur Ashkin is an American physicist born in September 1922 in Brooklyn, New York. As an undergraduate at Columbia during the Second World War, he worked part-time at the Columbia Radiation Lab, building magnetrons for the U.S. military radar systems. Receiving a B.A. in 1947, Ashkin moved to Cornell. Here he studied nuclear physics for a doctoral degree, deciding in the end not to pursue a career in this field where his older brother, Julius, already was a renowned scientist participating in the Manhattan Project. Obtaining a PhD in 1952 from Cornell University, Ashkin got an invitation from his former supervisor at Columbia, Sid Millman, to join the Bell Labs and started working there, researching microwaves before switching to lasers. He was the head of the Department of Laser Science at Bell Labs, Homedale, for over 20 years, from 1963 to 1987, from time to time also filling in as a member of the technical staff. Ashkin's dream was to trap and manipulate atoms. And in 1986, he and his colleague Stephen Chu, Nobel Laureate 1997, demonstrated the first stable optical atom trap, later known as optical tweezers. Ashkin then focused on developing the tweezers to capture and study living things, like bacteria, algae, red blood cells, without harming them. His success has a huge impact on biological research, allowing, for instance, to study how infectious organisms attack healthy cells. Although still active, unfortunately, as I said before, Dr. Ashkin cannot be with us today, he sends a greeting, though, and a close associate, Dr. René Jean Essiambre, who will give the talk in his stead. And so I invite Dr. Essiambre to join me on stage. Uh, I'm Art Ashkin. I want to thank the Royal Academy of Sciences for the great honor of a Nobel Prize. And you know I can't be here for the, when the time comes, but my friend Rene, who's a fellow Bell Labs man, very good friend, he's going to deliver the lecture in my place. And, well, okay, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. So it is a great pleasure to be here today to deliver the 2018 Physics Nobel Prize Lecture of Arthur Ashkin. As you just saw on the video, we prepared the um, presentation together and it reflects what he wanted to discuss today. So this lecture is on optical tweezers and the application to biological systems. First, 
I will present a few historical events that shows that our art, art was interested by the action of light from a very young age. Then I will talk about the early days of optical trapping, light pressure, the origin of laser trapping, optical levitation. And then I will discuss the work that was recognized by the Nobel Committee, optical tweezers, laser trapping of biological particles, and then uh, biological application of optical tweezers. In 1932, Art was 10 years old, and he was fascinated by the Crookes radiometer. So a Crookes radiometer is, uh, it looks like this, it's uh, four veins that are linked together and suspended on the pinwheel. Each of the veins have a dark side, a black side, and the other side is highly reflective, like act as a mirror. And all of that is within a glass bulb with a partial vacuum. So when light shines on a quark radiometer, the black side starts to move away from the light, so it starts to move in this clockwise direction here. So the Crookes radiometer is moving due to thermal effects. In 1944, when Art was 22 years old, I'm sorry, yeah, 22 years old. He was working on the pulse magnetron, like was mentioned earlier. He was at the Columbia Radiation Lab. So he decided one day to shine this magnetron to uh, the diaphragm of a phone earpiece. And the magnetron was operating at one kilohertz, and he saw a one kilohertz trace on the oscilloscope. At the time, he thought it could be radiation pressure. It's in 1966, uh, a few years after the laser was invented and demonstrated, Art went to a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, where he saw a video by Rawson. And in the video, you would see the particle inside the laser, in the internal beam of the laser, to start to move in straight line and bounce around. And at the time, the author, authors, Ranson and May, suggested that it could be a, a few different things. One was light pressure, the other one was thermal effects. So Art uh, calculated what the light pressure would do and figured out that it could not be uh, light pressure. So after a few months, everybody settled to say that it is thermal effects. But the main impact of this uh, video on art is to reignite his interest in light pressure. So what is light pressure? So let's consider two different types of objects, a metallic mirror that is uh, highly reflective, and a transparent small sphere. So when a photon comes and hits a mirror, if it's a tiny mirror, it's going to start to move in the opposite direction to conserve the momentum as the photon has been reflected and the mirror goes in the other direction. For a power of 1 watt, this corresponds to a force of 10 minus 8 Newton, which may appear extremely small. But let's look at a transparent sphere that is one micro in diameter, so it's very small. So if we shine light on it, let's say we have a photon that arrives at the upper part, is deflected downwards, and the sphere will start to move upwards in, uh, in, in reaction to the photon, uh, changing its direction so that the momentum is conserved. If the photon arrives in the lower part of the sphere, it's it deflected upward, and the sphere goes downwards. So this is the basic mechanism for this, uh, um, trapping. If you have two photons going uh, symmetrically located, the small sphere will go forward. For a power of one watt on one micro, uh, micron sphere, 
the acceleration it can induce on the sphere is on the order of 100,000 times the force of gravity. So the radiation pressure that appears to be very small on a very uh, small object, like a, a transparent sphere, can, be, can produce tremendous accelerations. So now let's consider what happens if the sphere is not exactly on the axis of the laser as it was in the previous slide, but now it's half axis. So what will happen to that sphere, the transparent sphere? So the laser has, of course, higher intensity near the center, and the laser goes in that direction, and lower intensity at the edges. So as we saw in the previous uh, animation, if a, a photon arrives on the uh, upper part of the sphere, it, go, it will be deflected and there will be a force for, on the sphere. If the photon arrives at the lower part, the force in the other direction on the sphere. So that the sum of the force can be decomposed into two forces, the scattering force, which makes the sphere move in the direction of the beam, a gradient force that makes the sphere go toward the center of the beam. So what is very interesting here is that the sphere will be attracted to the high power region of the laser, which seems a little bit counterintuitive, but it actually happens. So the sphere goes towards the, the center of the beam. So let's look at a little animation. So the photons are arriving here, more photons at the top because it's near the center, more, less photons here, and the ball will start to move toward the center of the beam. When it's at the center, it just moves forward to the scattering force. And here, it's going to hit a slide, a microscope slide that stops the sphere. So the sphere is trapped by the beam on the left and by the microscope slide on the right. So Art got the idea that, uh, because he saw this phenomenon, that he could actually put two beams counterpropagating and put a sphere in the middle, a transparent sphere, and this sphere will be trapped because the scattering force of this beam and the scattering form of this beam will, be, uh, com will compensate each other, and the, the particle will be in, a, in equilibrium there. So that's part of his notebook in 1969. And this notebook uh, was signed uh, by Eric Ippen and Peter Wolf, two uh, famous scientists on their own, and signed by Arthur Ashkin on September 8th. So here's a little animation on this uh, two-beam trap. So all the photons arrive symmetrically, so the net force on the sphere is zero and doesn't move. So this is the first all-optical trap. So Art decided in the next year, in 71, to a look at what will happen if he takes the laser and turn it upwards and use gravity as a force to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to produce a trapping. So here's the uh, laser. So initially, the sphere is uh, sitting on microscope slide. Then we turn on the laser, but it's too low power. The sphere is not levitating. We increase the power, more photons, and the sphere will start to levitate. And eventually, this at the height that is determined by the laser power and the beam divergence. So Art decided that he would try to measure the charge of the electron using an optical uh, levitator. So here's the setup. That was in 1980. So there is a sphere that is um, levitating, and there is a feedback control where it's monitoring the height of that sphere, and uh, it changes the power of the laser to keep the height the same. So then it shined UV light in the chamber. That created electrons, and he applied difference of voltage, uh, something similar to the Millikan experiment. So the, char the, the sphere started to uh, acquire charges, and uh, the uh, power of the laser 
it's adjusted automatically to compensate the electric force that the sphere will undergo under this difference of potential. So here are the measurements. So you can see that this is a, the charging time, so how long the UV light is on, and this is the power of the laser needed to levitate. And you can see as the UV light shines and, and charges are created uh, on the sphere, the power to levitate changes. And of course, it's actually a step exactly by the power uh, the, by the charge of the electron. It's a discrete power change that corresponds to the charge of the electron. And this is a very high uh, accuracy measurement of the electron charge using optical levitators. Now, let's talk about optical tweezers. Uh, the term optical tweezers has been co coined by Art himself, and he has been rewarded for the Nobel Prize for this work. So, what is optical tweezers? So a laser here that goes to a high numerical aperture microscope objective, focus the light uh, very tightly, just uh, not too far from the objective. And what happens is that if we look here at a zoom on this uh, location, at the center here, the minimum size of the beam, the waist of the beam, the highest power is in the middle here. Then there is a gradient in the transverse direction that any laser has. It has more power near the center of the beam than on the edges. But now, because of this very tight focusing, the, there is a gradient of power along the axis of the beam. So now, from the center here to going forward, there is a very big gradient of power. And what is the impact of that? So we have learned from previous slides that a sphere is attracted towards the region of high power. So the sphere will experience a force that's called a gradient force that is not uh, forward, but is backward. So it's, the sphere wants to go back to the center of the laser. And if you have a sufficient focusing, then the, the gradient force will exceed the scattering force that is always there and produce a, and attract a small sphere towards the center of the beam, but not exactly at the center. There's a little bit offset where there's a maximum gradient of light. So the sphere will settle just before the focus. So in a single beam, you can, track, uh, you can trap a small uh, spherical transparent uh, uh, particle. So let's see it in operation. So here we have an optical levitator, which will be used just to bring the spheres next to the tweezers. On top, you have the optical tweezers. So the sphere is at the bottom of, of the tank. We turn the laser on. So the, the tweezer here has a, uh, is a fixed power, very high intensity near the, the focus point. Then there is low intensity of the levitator. It's not sufficient to levitate. Then we increase the power of the levitator. The particle goes up and then it's trapped. So a particle, uh, let's do it again. So the, when the particle lifts, it becomes trapped all of a sudden at this location just after the focus. So that's the way an optical tweezers works. So let's now talk about some of the biological uh, application that Art himself measured. So in 1987, Art and Joe Jejitz, his uh, technical assistant, set up a microscope to trap bacteria using a 1.06 micron neodymium YAG laser. So he started with uh, non-living organisms and something that doesn't have the shape of, uh, of a sphere. So here, I'm going to show a video where that he took himself, where you can see this uh, irregular particle being moved by an optical uh, tweezer. And you can see, obviously, that it's not circular, but uh, it's going to be manipulated by the optical tweezers. So the laser is at one micron, so we cannot see. It's not visible. But uh, when it's turned on, it moves this, uh, this small object here. 
So it shows that you don't need a sphere to use optical tweezers to exert force on objects. Then he, he turns his attention to living organisms. So here's a paramecium. A paramecium is a single cell organism. It, has, it is between 50 and 330 microns, so it's fairly big. Uh, it has an internal component called organelles, and uh, they range from a few microns to a few tens of microns. Here's a video uh, that Art took, where he trapped one of the organelles. So I want to attract your attention here to the white uh, dot, which is uh, an organelle. And uh, he's going to trap them, uh, trap the organelle uh, twice. So let's look at the video. So this organelle is trapped, and the paramecium will move. And then when it, uh, the, the organelle hits the wall, it uh, exits the trap, and it's going to be trapped again. And when it hits the wall, it uh, leaves the trap again. And now, let's look at what happens to a tobacco mosaic virus. A tobacco mosaic virus is very long, so it's very different from a sphere. So I want to attract your attention here, this uh, rectangle. So the tobacco mosaic virus is, is free, it's moving around, then it's going to be trapped, so now it's trapped, doesn't move, and then it's turned <coughs> in the, uh, inwards, and because it's trapped using uh, by the end of, of the virus, because the end of the virus refracts light more, and the optical tweezers is stronger. And now, uh, Art decided to uh, trap spermatozoin, and we can listen to him uh, describing what he's, he's doing. This is 1988. Uh, the, the trap may not, uh, I don't know, the power may not be high enough, or he's too active. Right here, let me put up, I'll give you, well, this is about the maximum power. Let's see if you can see. Here, let me move. see, here, I'm moving him. Now I got a reference to move him, right? Mm -hmm. Here you can see I'm moving him. Mm -hmm. So that's working. So now let's talk about a few different uh, applications. <clears throat> so molecular motors are biological molecules, uh, molecular machines that are the essential agent of movement in living organism. So here's an example of the kinesine. The kinesine um, is a <clears throat> molecular motor that can carry a load. Here, a bead has been attached to a kinesine, and the kinesine is on a microtubule. So the kinesin want to transport that bead, and that bead is being trapped by an optical tweezer. And this optical tweezer is soft in the sense that it traps the bead, but not too strongly. So the bead is kind of free to move a little bit, and as it moves, the, it, it, it deflects uh, the, be the beam uh, of the tweezer, so it can be detected where the bead is in the tweezer. And if we look now at measurements, those are three different measurements. <clears throat> the step size here, this is a function of time, of the position of the, of the bead, and you can see the bead move and by a step size of eight nanometers. So the bead is kind of, the kinesin uh, is kind of walking along the microtubule, so it's making an eight nanometer step, uh, stop for a while, and another nanometer step, and, and so on. So now let's look now at something a little bit more advanced, <clears throat> which is uh, the measurement of uh, uh, the DNA on, on DNA templates. So a DNA template is attached to one bead, which is in a trap. Then the RNA polymerase is attached to another bead, also in a trap. One of the trap is soft, so it let the bead move. The other one is strong. The bead is, doesn't move much or at all. And in the, what we're going to observe here is that the NRA polymer, polymerase is uh, transcribing the, the DNA. And we're going to see a video that is at 30 times the speed of the two beads moving uh, from a single DNA and single RNA polymerase uh, uh, in action. So the bead is moving, as you can see. 
And what brings them together is uh, the RNA polymerase uh, transcription. So now, if we look at the measurements of this distance between the beads, this is a, a, a measurement that is about 1,200 seconds. So we can zoom on it because it has a very high resolution by a factor of 10. So we see how there are, sometimes there's no motion, sometimes there is motion. And if we zoom even further, we can see that now there are steps of 3.4 Armstrong. So 3.4 Armstrong is only a few atoms wide. And this 3.4 Armstrong corresponds to the distance between the nucleotides of the DNA. There are other applications also of uh, this um, uh, of uh, tweezers. Uh, here are some biopolymers properties, motion and forces of linear and rotary molecular motors, uh, molecular behaviors of nucleic acid enzymes, folding in st of structured nucleic acid in proteins, protein binding, and micro manipulation of small objects in general and probably many more to come. There are also several companies uh, selling optical tweezers for different applications and different types of tweezers. Art also wrote a book in uh, 2006, published in 2006. Uh, he wrote it with the help of his uh, assistant of his wife, Aline, where he presents the fundamental of uh, optical trapping. Uh, it discusses different biological applications of optical tweezers. It's also an historical account of the development of optical trapping uh, around the world, but also at Bell Lab. So here are some other people uh, closest to him. Uh, Joe Jejit, with whom he worked for uh, many decades. His wife of 64 years, Aline, and uh, some of his closest collaborators over the years. Thank you.